Good evening, and thank you for attending. My name is Natalie Sayre, and I'll be the moderator for this evening's candidate debate. Before we begin, please silence all phones and electronic devices. Additionally, please refrain from any interruption to the debate as it is being recorded for on-demand viewing and post-captioning services. Joining us this evening is Mr. Tom Collins with the Citizens Clean Elections Commission. The Citizens Clean Elections Commission is the sponsor for this evening's event. The Clean Elections Act is a campaign finance reform and public education measure initiated by Arizona citizens and passed by voters in 1998. The Clean Elections Act was created to allow campaigns to be more issue-oriented and less negative. The system provides full funding for qualified candidates who participate voluntarily. The candidates agree to abide by the Clean Elections Act and rules, which include contribution and spending limits, foregoing special interest money, as well as participating in commission debates. The candidates invited to participate tonight are in contested primaries. Candidates in uncontested primaries are not included in the debate process. For tonight's debate, questions have been prepared by Clean Elections based on a voter survey, as well as questions that have been submitted by voters through the Clean Elections smartphone app. However, we encourage live questions first. If you have questions, please print them clearly on the note card given to you when you walked in and hold it up. Our volunteers will pick up the cards and deliver them to me. If you need additional cards, just raise your hand. We screen questions for clarity to eliminate duplications, speeches, or personal attacks on candidates. The debate is scheduled for one hour, so we may not get to all audience questions, but we will do our best. There's an independent timer who will see that all the candidates have their allotted time to answer questions and will tell them when their time is up. Tonight's debate includes one minute opening statements, a lightning round. The first half of the debate will begin with two minutes to answer audience questions. Each candidate will answer the same audience question and we will rotate which candidate responds first. All after all candidates have responded to the question, the first responding candidate will be given an additional 30 seconds. The second half will allow a different question per candidate with one minute to answer. And then finally, one minute closing statements. If you have a question for a specific candidate, please include the candidate's name on the note card. It will be considered for the second half of the debate. We ask that you remain polite to all of the candidates and give them a fair and uninterrupted hearing, no matter how strongly you may agree or disagree with anything being said. Tonight's participants are Mr. Aaron Bauman, Democrat, State Representative for District Number 2, running for State Representative District 2, Ms. Rosanna Galvalon, Democrat, Clean Elections Participant, running for State Representative in District Number 2, and Mr. Daniel Hernandez, a Democrat state representative running for district number two. The order in which the candidates will speak has been determined by alphabetical order by last name for opening comments and will progress from that starting point. The closing order will be determined by reverse alphabetical order by last name. Mr. Bauman, your opening comments, please. So my name is Aaron Bauman. And as you know, I'm running to represent Southern Arizona Legislative District 2 in the State House of Representatives. I've recently graduated from the, univers the University of Arizona College of Law, which means I will soon be a lawyer. And in my experience at the law school, I learned firsthand that the law in Arizona doesn't work for everybody. And that the, legisla the legislature, the individual legislators in this state, do not protect the rights of those who they're elected to serve the citizens, workers, and students. And having never run for office before, I decided that I was tired of, tired of complaining and that I wanted to get involved. And so here I am running. My family has a long history in the state, and I hope to have a long future in the state. And I think all of our livelihoods and the future of the state of Arizona depends on individual action. And so I'm running to try to represent you to the best of my ability in the state house. Thank you. Ms. Galvalon. Thank you, Natalie. Good evening. It's wonderful to be here. I am um, serving my second term as your Arizona State Representative, and it is an honor and privilege to be there at the State Capitol. Um, I've been in Southern Arizona since 1973, and it's been my home, and I really love it down here. Uh, I serve as a full-time legislator. Um, I spend all my time 
serving my constituents as long as serving with other boards that that um, that I really enjoy doing. Um, I was uh, after four years, I was successful to be able to pass two bills through the House. Unfortunately, in the Senate, they were they were. Um, they died in the Senate, so that's unfortunate. But um, it's an honor that the Speaker of the House has actually appointed me to some interim committees. I look forward to serving my constituents through that way. And um, also, um, again, this is my third time running, and I, and I really, really enjoy serving the public. It's been my honor and privilege to, to continue to do so, and I look forward to serving two more years. Thank you. Mr. Hernandez. Uh, good evening. I'd like to thank the Citizens Clean Elections Commission for hosting us tonight. And I want to talk about education. Um, this weekend there was some thing that came out that I wanted to address tonight at the outset of tonight's debate. Education has been one of the most important issues in my life. It is the reason why I ran for the Sunnyside Unified School District Governing Board twice. It's the reason why I've served that community to try and make sure we're giving all Southern Arizonans, regardless of whether their socioeconomic status, opportunities to learn. My senior year at the University of Arizona was quite a hectic one, as many of you can remember. 2011 started with the shooting in January 8th of 2011 of Congresswoman Gabby Giffords. I was elected to the Sunnyside School Board and shortly thereafter started serving. In the turmoil of that year, I had an incident where I ended up having one class short. I was not notified until very recently, but it is a mistake that I should have found out about a long time ago. It's something that I'm looking forward to rectifying in the next couple weeks. Um, I just found out that in July, I'll be able to finish the class, and then I'll be able to be done with my degree by the end of August. Thank you. To break the ice, we will start with a quick lightning round. Please answer with one word. Ms. Galvadon, Pandora or Spotify? Pandora. Mr. Hernandez, CNN, Fox News, or MSNBC? CNN. Mr. Bauman, Netflix or Hulu? Netflix. Ms. Galvadon, Lumberjack, Sun Devil, or Wildcat? <laughs> Bear down, Wildcats. <laughs> Mr. Hernandez, Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Trek. And Mr. Bauman, Starbucks or Dunkin'? Starbucks. At this time, we will begin the uh, portion of the debate where each candidate will answer the same question. The first question is for Mr. Hernandez. How do we address the gender gaps in STEM and executive careers? You know, this is something that I have a lot of experience with as a school board member. It's been a priority for me to make sure that we're creating opportunities, particularly while students are young. Um, I was instrumental in opening up a K-8 fine arts magnet school, but it's integrated with STEM technology. So really, it's get them while they're young and then make sure that we provide supports throughout for young women to continue to be involved. So for me, it was let's open up a K-8 fine arts magnet school where we in integrate STEM, but then make sure that we're providing opportunities for young men and women, regardless of where they come from, to be able to be involved and engaged. So getting them while they're young, but also providing resources, and I think that's why I've been a big proponent of funding JTED at the ninth grade level, because right now, one of the things that we do is we may have programs here and there, but we don't have sustainable funding for a lot of these programs, which allow career and technical education opportunities for all students. So funding JTED at the ninth grade level to make sure that young women particularly have the ability to be in throughout their entire high school career, but starting them even younger by doing things like uh, engineering is elementary, which is a program we have at Sunnyside, having them in different programs where they can explore different STEM fields, not just the nursing and caring facilities, because those are traditionally female roles, but allowing them to work with cars, allowing them to work inside of engineering facilities, looking at how we manufacture things. We have a young woman here in Sunnyside who was awarded and was the only young woman in the country to get a special kind of certification to build parts for planes. So giving them opportunities to explore and find what they're interested in when they're younger. Thank you. Mr. Bauman, your response. Yes, it's a, it's a crucial issue and one that's, that's near to my heart. My, uh, my mother, my sister, and my girlfriend are all physicians. And frankly, I think it certainly depends on government resources, community health, uh, early childhood education, K through 12, but it also depends on changing the culture. I know from my experience of my mother's career that frankly women are perceived differently in the workplace, that a woman as a boss, as an employer, is not treated the same as a man. And Perhaps we see it to some degree in the current presidential race, that a woman with authority is perceived in certain ways detrimental to her gender. And so changing the culture in these ways 
um, by, you know, through families and through individual action is, I think, most important. And certainly having individuals in the government who respect women and respect women's uh, ability to perform to the same level as men is also crucial. And so I hope to enact these values as a legislator. Thank you. Ms. Galadon, your Investment in our, in our educational system is so important. I, instead of uh, uh, STEM, I always say STEAM. We need to add the arts in there. Um, hear, hearing presentations regarding how um, students really relate to the arts is something very important as well, where students stay in school because they are they uh, are in those in those art classes. But getting back to, to STEM, it's very important that we get all students interested, but especially our young ladies that actually want to go into the engineering um, field. You know, uh, having having those technical jobs. You know, right now Arizona doesn't know where those future jobs are, and so if we can we can uh, invest, and we must invest. The state of Arizona must invest in in STEM and and JTED. Uh, there was a, a conversation. Uh, uh, this last uh, session where, where um, JTED was taken away and then we were able to restore it. And that was thanks to the citizens of the state of Arizona as well as us, us legislators that really pushed for that issue. Um, it, it, we, ne we need to really get them young. And so those are, the, those are the kind of things where when we do the education, we need to, to move forward. Um, there's a coalition right now that started. It's called the Ariz it's, it's called the Arizona Schools Now, and that is something that that uh, not only uh, uh, organizations but the community is getting involved, so that we can invest in our future, and especially our young ladies who seem to be kind of um, pushed to the side. And we really need to focus on all students and at a young age was mentioned, and I think it's very important that we invest. I like first things first when they say um, set for, um, it's uh, ready for school, set for life. That's what we need to do. We need to prepare our students for life. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hernandez, your 30-second response. To the folks that uh, are up here, I agree with a lot of what's been said, but I think what we really need to do is focus on specific policies, which is why I outlined two specific things that I'd like to do, which is really look at reinvesting at the STEM and the JTED funding at the ninth grade level, because I think that's a concrete way that we can get folks, especially in the business community, to say we need to work harder to give more opportunities for the, these young women. Um, so I, I don't really have any disagreements. I think uh, we're all on the same page that we have to do all of these things to be able to get this done. Thank you. Mr. Bauman, next question. If you could write your ideal gun control law knowing it would pass, what would it entail? Wow, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think that certainly it would involve bans on assault weapons. I think that it would involve increased background checks. The problem that I have generally, though, with the current gun control debate is that it, well, certainly access to guns and access to weapons is an element of the outbreak of mass violence that we've seen. There's certainly more to it than that. And so I, my ideal gun control legislation would involve gun control, but it also would involve addressing what is causing this alienation in individuals that's leading them to act out in these ways of, of mass terrifying violence. And I think that involves community health. I think it involves investment in mental health resources. And I think it involves also changing our priorities abroad, changing our domestic priorities, and changing our political discourse such that we're not, we're not always arguing and we're, fi we're finding ways to enfranchise people and to, and to make them secure in their status and their lives and hopeful for their futures. Thank you. Ms. Gavaldon, same question. Thank you. You know, it, gu guns are, 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 it's a problem. It's a problem all, all, all across our, our country. We, we see um, people dying for, and, wh and why? Why do we, because we don't have, we don't have the, the reform that w that's needed for guns. Um, you know, when, when I read about these articles, um, and it, 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 it seems to stem from behavioral health. Absolutely. Where, and, and the thing is, is we can avoid that if we really look and, and invest in um, our, our individuals that need this mental health. Um, I, 
I believe that um, when it comes to gun control, it needs to start in our Constitution. We need to really look at the Second Amendment and, and revisit it and, and, and see what we as a, I know that it's a very difficult. I know that, that the gun lobby is very strong in our country, but it's, it's something that's a conversation that we need to talk about because too many people are dying. Too many people are, are, are um, not, not being able to, to um, uh, I, uh, there's so many people that don't like guns. And when, when I'm on the, the floor of the, of the House and, and the Speaker of the House is allowing individuals to actually have guns on their position, possession, I feel that is wrong. That is something, and, and I, asked, I asked them, why do you have um, a, a gun? And they said, just in case. I said, well, is, is the problem public safety? No, it's not. It is something that they believe, it, and, and I keep hearing it's my God-given right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's something that we need to really look at, starting at, with our Constitution. We have to look at, at reforming our gun laws. This is something that we cannot stop doing. Those conversations have to continue, and we must get uh, assault rifles out of the hands of people. Thank you. Mr. Hernandez, same question. You know, Hearing that question, I think I take a little bit of umbrage. You know, it's not about gun control. It's about gun violence prevention. There are 300 million guns in this country, one for every man, woman, and child in this country. And what's really happened is the conversation, and I know this because as a gun violence survivor, I've seen it firsthand, the conversation has shifted into two polar opposites. There is the guns now, guns forever, more guns all the time, and the folks who are really saying, let's just get rid of this or let's get rid of that. This is, not a multi, this is not a one solution size fits all problem. This is a multi-pronged problem that involves so many different things. So we need to look at mental health, but we need to be careful to not to stigmatize because one of the biggest problems that happens is for all of the folks who have mental health issues, 95% will never harm themselves. They're more likely to harm them, sorry, they're not likely to harm anyone but themselves. So we cannot stigmatize people seeking mental health help that they need. Secondly, we need to make sure that we're doing what we can to limit access for firearms. Right now, we have a patchwork of laws that exist in this country that I've been working on trying to close loopholes everywhere from Arizona to Nevada to make sure that we have the same background checks for all gun sales, regardless of whether you buy it in a brick and mortar shop or if you buy it online. But thirdly, I think, most importantly, if you are someone who is on the terrorist watch list, like the young man who you know, was being investigated by the FBI in Orlando, you should not be allowed to go in and buy a gun. We need to make sure we're addressing this problem in multifaceted ways. So we are addressing this issue because it's not one singular issue. I think another thing that we need to look is reasonable restrictions on things like ammunition. So we're not feeding the beast, so-called, because we know that if you don't have the bullets to go into those guns and have capacity magazines that are over 30 that allow someone with a semi-automatic weapon to fire 30 rounds in less than nine seconds, we will not have as much carnage in a lot of these situations. So it's a lot of different components. Thank you. Mr. Bauman, your 30-second response. Uh, obviously, we have similar positions, but to Ms. Gabaldon's point about the Second Amendment, the Second Amendment protects individuals' rights to possess weapons for the purpose of uh, developing a well-regulated militia. And so as a law graduate, this is something that was meaningful 250 years ago and retains some meaning, but only using some kind of balancing test. What's the value of allowing individuals to carry weapons versus what's the harm? And so certainly recently we've seen vast harm that in certain cases obviously outweighs individuals' rights to carry. Thank you. Ms. Galvadon, next question. How will you help in, to ensure that state government does its part in helping Southern Arizona adapt and respond to the serious impacts of the warming climate? Thank you. Um, climate change is something that, that has been um, talked about. I've, I've attended several uh, sessions on that and and in regards to to what what not only is Arizona facing but the whole the whole United States and Arizona really needs to look at at, at what we're doing uh, to the environment how how we can um, 
look at that. Uh, there was there was a talk I just recently heard about watersheds and and how they're looking at at more of uh, putting in more vegetation and less concrete and how we can do more open spaces in, in regards to to uh, climate change. I think it's something that that we as a state really need to take it very seriously. This is something that's really impacting us. When we're getting these 117 degrees, you know, people are are, are really facing the the uh, hardship because it's getting hotter and hotter out there. So, in regards to doing something in Arizona, those those, those conversations have been had up in up at the Capitol, and we need to continue to have those those conversations in regards to addressing the the more of looking at our environment, looking at emissions, looking at at um, how how we're really building our new buildings, um, our water supply, all of that where where we where we're what we're facing is something that is going to affect all of us. And so um, in, in conclusion, I, I believe that climate change is something that we really need to look at. We need to look at our environment and, there's some, and, and that conversation is, supposed to, is, is going to be very important to us. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Arizona is a state that is very obviously a desert, so we need to be very conscious of a few things. And at top of that list is water usage. We are a state that has done a lot in terms of water reclamation, but when you look at how much water we're reusing as a state, it's woefully low compared to many other countries. Um, there's a lot of lessons we can learn from places like Spain and from Israel particularly, which in most cases is able to reuse our water up to 85%. So I think we need to be more innovative at the way that we use and reuse our water. That's number one. Number two, we need to also look at alternative sources of energy. Just using coal-fired plants and natural gas plants you know, is not the solution for the 21st century. We need to look at using things like solar, and it's something that has been a big topic of conversation throughout Arizona for the last couple of years, and it's been a really controversial one. And I think what we need to do is find a way to bring the power suppliers and the people who care about solar and the environment together, because right now this conversation of it's either coal-fired plants or you have solar power is not a solution that's gonna drive us to the 21st century that we need. So we need to look at incentivizing and working to create sustainable solar usage in the state of Arizona. It's a travesty that Germany has more solar powered uh, plants and has more solar panels than the state of Arizona. We need to look at also making sure that when we're working, we find bridges. You know, We really need to make sure that we don't just go from cold, hard coal, which we've had for decades, and then say, okay, now you're required to go to solar power, we need to find ways to transition people and to give job training opportunities for those who may have built their careers working in one industry and transitioning to the new modern industry. There's a lot of jobs that can be had in, it's an economic development piece, to create people who are able to go and install solar panels and making sure that they're doing this well and they're, they're doing this with middle to low skills. Thank you. And Mr. Bowman, your uh, 30 second response. Uh, I didn't answer the question. Oh, I'm sorry. That would be my flub. Please have your two-minute response. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, so clearly clearly a huge issue in Arizona. We should be the solar capital of the world, and we're not. So I worked recently at the Natural Resources Defense Council, which is an international environmental nonprofit dedicating, get dedicated to protecting clean air, clean water, investing in renewable energy. And while there, some of the things that the that the environmental movement as a whole is doing, and some of the things that I worked on, for example, are researching ways to use drones to spy on logging companies. And I think it's representative of this confrontational, uh, partisan, polarizing aspect to the debate that, like, like Daniel said, isn't necessary. It doesn't have to be coal states versus solar states. If we protect, like I mentioned in a previous answer, this solidarity that we should feel as a country, I think that we'll see that it's clearly a good investment to, in, to invest in solar, that it creates jobs, and that some of the dirty forms of energy disproportionately harm low-income communities and minorities. And so this aspect of climate justice, climate justice, environmental justice, shouldn't be swept under the rug. In our district, for example, when we're talking about the Rosemont Mine, the proposed Rosemont Mind, and I being a candidate who has forcefully and vociferously opposed the mine, we have to talk about how this mine harms 
the communities who have no voice in government, have no voice in the legislature. And when we're talking about the way that the mine will potentially affect the water supply for some of the low-income communities in South Tucson, uh, I think we need to, as legislators, as public officials, speak for those people and ensure that, as a state and as a country, we're taking a well-rounded view of what is a positive investment for our state. Thank you. Now, Ms. Galvadon, your 30-second response. I know um, water was brought up quite a few times. I'm, I am the Democratic ranking member of the Agriculture, Water, and Lands at at uh, the legislature, and, and issues are brought up to us regarding water sustainability. And um, it was an honor that I was actually invited to sit on, on um, uh, a leadership panel um, that is through the Kyle Center for, for Water Sustainability. Uh, the, uh, excuse me, it's the Kyle Center for, for, um, for Water. But um, what, what's, what was most important is we actually learned about, what, uh, about groundwater and how important it is uh, to really look at, at uh, our supply. Thank you. At this time, we will begin the portion of the debate where each candidate will answer a different question, and you'll have one minute to respond. So the first question is for Mr. Hernandez, and here is your question. What can you do as a member of the minority to affect the process uh, of developing legislation and moving our democratic agenda? You know, it's something that I have a lot of experience with from my time as an advocate with Every Town for Gun Safety, which used to be Mayors Against Illegal Guns. I worked with Republicans to make sure that we passed one of the most important bills in recent history in the state of Arizona to actually report mental health information into the next criminal background check system. A system is only as good as the, the database is only as good as the data that you've entered. So I have experience doing that. I've also worked to kill bills. Um, I worked with Governor Brewer and her public safety folks to be able to veto guns in public buildings. Ultimately, it was her choice. But as a Democrat in the minority, it's about working to build these strategic relationships, building partnerships with Republicans, and actually being able to get things done. So it's something that I have a strong track record of, and I want to continue doing what I've done for years, which is advocating for these progressive values, but doing it in a pragmatic way where we may not get 100% of what we want today, but we can build upon past successes to get things done more and more over time, not just having a total loss, because that's what happens far too often at the legislature. Thank you. Ms. Galvadon, this question. How important is honesty in running for political office and what does that mean to you? Integrity is very important. Honesty is very important. So when, when um, uh, I'll speak for myself. When I, when I, I speak, I, I'm, I'm going to, to do the best I can to, to keep my commitments. Honesty is very important. Integrity, um, relationships. When I'm building relationships with my, my colleagues across the aisle, I'm honest, and I was able to, to get two bills passed through the House because of my relationship with my, my colleagues from across the aisle. That is building relationships. That is, that is talking. We have, we have so much common ground. And, when, and when, I, uh, when I'm honest with my constituents, when I'm honest with my colleagues from across the aisle and my caucus, I get things done. I'm able to, to speak and I'm able to, to um, have the, the respect. Um, I'm, I'm very proud that I'm, I'm considered a statesman at the, at the state capitol because I'm willing to speak to everybody and I am an honest person and I, and I am very proud of my, that I am, I'm full of integrity. Thank you. Mr. Bauman, how would you get dark money out of the state elections or out of state elections? I think we need a more robust clean election system. As, as many of us know, when the clean election system was first passed, it involved something called matching funds, which allowed clean elections candidates to have the state provide funds to equal what was raised by any traditional candidate. And so that part of the law was cut out by the courts. And so I think if we want to get dark money out of politics, and it's really devastating our political system. As many of us follow with the Arizona Corporations Commission, the electric utilities buy the commission that's supposed to be regulating them. And so if we're to get dark money out of politics, we need a clean election system that guarantees public funding to all candidates and guarantees that money doesn't determine who wins an election. The people do. Thank you. Mr. Hernandez, how do we address the wage gap for female minorities and mothers? 
you know, we live in 2016, and yet women are disproportionately offend, uh, uh, affected, particularly those of color, by the low wages that we have in this state. And I think one of the first steps is really looking at addressing the issue about minimum wage, because many of the people who earn minimum wage are not these 15 and 16 year old kids that we are portrayed to have in you know burger places and grocery stores. It is single mothers, most often, women who are of color, people who have been earning the same wages for decades and have not seen growth, other than when we've had the minimal increases so I think we need to examine minimum wage, but we also need to make sure that we're doing things at the state level to ensure that there is transparency in wages and in salaries, especially in different positions, and that at all levels at the state, if there is any contractor that they are required to provide the same, regardless of a person's gender, pay for the work that's being done. Thank you. Ms. Galvadon, what is your specific plan to defeat Ackerley? Uh, that's... That's, that's an interesting question. Um, that uh, I I have worked with with Representative Ackerley, and we have we have gotten things done. Um, uh, uh, the word defeat I, I feel is is not uh, appropriate. Uh, I believe that I'm going to run my own campaign. I'm going to to um, uh, stick with the facts. Um, you know, we both have voting records where we are uh, graded on it. We there is reports that are given. Um, I I believe I represent my constituents much better. Um, I I represent their ideals, and I will continue to to run a very positive campaign. Thank you, Mr. Bauman. What would you? try to accomplish in the legislature to open voter registration or vote, voter registration in Arizona? To open voter registration? To open voter registration in Arizona. Uh, so I take that question to be how do we get more people registered to vote? And I think having people running for office who represent the people who are voting, both their backgrounds and their values, and people running for office who can communicate honesty and integrity and who can talk to people at their homes about their lives. And it's something that I'm trying to do, knocking on doors, trying to reach people in a way that, that shows them that I'm just like you. And in a democracy, in a, in a republic, the people who make the decisions are just the people who find it in themselves or decide to run for office. And as long as, or if the politicians in this country and in this state can begin to to represent that to the people and represent that the government is a transparent constituency of the people of the state, then I think people will take more interest in politics and that will eventually lead to more people registering to vote and then voting. Thank you. Mr. Hernandez, how can the state prepare for the impacts of an aging population? I think there are a lot of different things that we need to be doing. Um, Arizona's population has already been aging for a long time. When you look at places like Green Valley and up in the northwest part of Tucson, we have had retirement communities for a long time. So what we need to do is really make sure that we're creating opportunities for job training um, to make sure that these folks who are either getting older or come here and don't want to retire. There are many people who are still young enough and want to keep working. So allowing them to have different opportunities to continue to be in the workforce and to be productive. And also for those who are on the younger side, training them for the opportunities that come with having an aging population, which means allowing folks to train in some of these professions, particularly in healthcare, which Arizona has a shorter a shortage of providers, particularly of physicians, and of those who are working directly with patients. So creating more opportunities at the school level, particularly K-12, for folks to train and get ready for these new jobs that are gonna be quite necessary for folks as they get older. Thank you. Ms. Gavalon. Please describe your latest random act of kindness. Thank you. Um, I was out canvassing. Uh, actually, it was yesterday, and there was a there was a lady that was having problems putting her her recycling and garbage can. Um, and um, so I we we chatted a little bit about the campaign, and and uh, and I said, "Ma'am, can I do that for you?" And she was so relieved. Um, I I. I I do that. I try to. I really reach out to people and 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 try to do some random act of kindness. Um, this is something that I that when I go talk to uh, s school children, I, I I tell them, you know, this 
be kind to each other, help each other. And, I, and random act of kindnesses are something that's very surprising. I know I have experienced them, and it feels really good when someone is nice to me. Thank you. Mr. Bauman, how do you intend to work against the Republican obstruction to get a budget that it adequately funds our three public universities? I think that we just have to continue holding our ground and fighting for progressive values while also maintaining and talking about the position that the universities provide a crucial service that is not adequately met by a budget that continually cuts funding. And furthermore, to provide that service, they need a budget that allows them to provide scholarships and to provide an education that's affordable to all Arizonans. And so how to get that through the legislature, how to get that into the budget, I think we just have to, like, like Daniel said, we have to hold our ground while also finding areas of common ground. And I think that there are Republicans who agree about the importance of public education. They might think that that end is served by cutting funds, but we can agree that we want an, ed an educated population and an educated workforce. And branching out from there, I think we can begin to get the universities back to where they Thank need you. to be in terms of funding. Thank you. Mr. Nandez, how do you plan to work effectively with a Republican majority to restore K through 12 funding? You know, I'm gonna point back to the things that I've talked about where I've built relationships and I'm able to get things done. But more importantly, I think one of the things that we need to leverage is a business community that is absolutely fed up of the Republican intransigence up at the Capitol. We need to leverage this, we need to work hard, we need to engage these as stakeholders because far too long they've been giving money just because they think, well, these people are in leadership, they'll eventually get to the right choice. We just need to give them time. And I think what they've come to realize is, no, you can't just throw more money at the problem. You need to be a part of the solution by holding the feet to the fire of those Republicans. So working to leverage our relationships and my relationships in the business community which is why I'm proud to have been endorsed by folks uh, throughout Arizona who are involved in business to say we need to talk to these legislators and say enough is enough. We need to focus on the priorities that the state needs to have, one of which is K-12 funding, but importantly, as was mentioned in the previous question, university funding to make sure that we not only train, but are able to recruit workers to get these high quality jobs done in the future. Thank you. Ms. Galvadon, what is your perspective on the adoption of a law to allow for the purchase and use of recreational marijuana among those 21 years older in Arizona? Um, I have actually uh, been a sponsor of legalizing marijuana. Uh, 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 Congressman Grijal, um, excuse me, uh, Gallego has actually come out, and I agree with them, uh, being able to, to regulate marijuana like alcohol. There's been study after study that has, has been addressed on, on um, le legalizing um, marijuana, and I think it's, it's important that that conversation be had and that, we, that I will continue to uh, support legislation to uh, legalize marijuana. Thank you. Mr. Bauman, if you were elected, what would be the first bill you would submit, and what would you consider your most important issue to address? That's a great question. Uh, the first bill that I would submit and the issue most important to me is equalizing the quality of education for all Arizonans. And so how this is immediately carried out by the Republican Party is that they're seeking to privatize education. But more subtly, our school districts and our schools receive different levels of funding based on what's the population of that district. So a district with a low income or a high percentage of minority students will receive less funding because the high income districts can pass bonds and overrides to guarantee more money for those students. And I think this is a travesty that the legislature needs to act on. It's not just a matter of, of ensuring a certain benchmark. It's a matter of ensuring adequacy and equality, which I think all legislators, Democrats and Republicans, have to get behind. Thank you. Mr. Hernandez, as heroin and prescription drug overdoses continue to escalate in Arizona, what steps would you take legislatively to help combat the ongoing opioid epidemic? 
you know, this is a problem that's affecting not just families in Arizona, but families all over this country. We have too few opportunities for people who want to take care of their loved ones to be able to get them the treatment that they need. And because of criminalization and the war on drugs that has persisted over the 80s and 90s and has carried over into today, we see that really oftentimes the only way to get treatment is to put someone into the system, which means going and getting incarcerated because they've either hurt themselves or someone else or damaged property. That is not the right way to treat this as an issue. We need to make sure that paramedics are trained to use some stop gaps to make sure that if someone overdoses, they have the medicine readily available to keep them alive until they get to the emergency room. We need to make sure also that we're creating treatment and prevention problems that are able to be used by family members to recommend that their family members be evaluated and maybe held to be able to start getting this treatment. Because right now it is a travesty that the only way to get this done in most places, especially if you're in rural Arizona, is if you've done something violent to yourself or someone else. Thank you. Ms. Galvadon. What is your opinion of the amount of money the state of Arizona spends in addressing the needs of the state and its citizens? Uh, it's not enough. When, when we had the cuts in 2008, we cut back on a lot of services that help um, our citizens. And, and I, always, I always say it isn't a handout, it's a hand up. And when we cut um, uh, funding, uh, the state cuts funding to, to our educational system, to our social services, um, uh, kids care, which, which uh, I, was so, I was so happy that it passed. Uh, 30,000 children can get uh, health insurance now. Uh, it's, it's not enough in regards to giving the money in our budget. Every year we, we put more money into our prisons and not our educational system. Arizona does three things. We educate, we medicate, and we incarcerate. And when we put too much money into incarceration, that is, that is something that needs to be addressed. Um, and again, Arizona really needs to put everything on the table and look at how we can put more money into our budget. We're sitting on close to a billion dollars between the surplus and rainy day fund. Let's put money back into helping people. Thank you. Mr. Bauman, if elected, what steps would you take to continue diversifying Arizona's economy and what industries and sectors would you focus on? I would focus on renewable energy and renewable energy, trade with our neighbor Mexico, and tourism. Like I said before, Arizona should be the capital of the world for the solar energy industry. And we have now a corporation commission which regulates the energy utilities that's making it harder to be a, a solar consumer. In Nogales, we have a beautiful $300 million recently constructed port of entry to uh, Mexico from the United States that is underutilized because Arizona as a state has failed to invest in infrastructure to serve that port of entry. And so if we, like Rosanna said, are investing in ways to help people as a state, we're investing in infrastructure and roads so that we can boost our economy in Arizona by trading with Mexico, which is one of the 20 largest economies in the world and is on our doorstep. And furthermore, the, the third point is if we invest in tourism, again, through our neighbor Mexico, uh, we can broaden our cultural and diversity base in the state. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hernandez, reports over the last couple of years have noted that Arizona has one of the worst shortages of doctors in the United States. How would you attempt to address this issue as an elected official? You know, there's one really concrete step that we can do this, and this is allowing nurses who are advanced practice nurses to actually practice to the full extent of their abilities and their education and training. Um, Arizona is a place where there are far too many communities, especially those like Nogales, and as we get into more rural parts of the state, that don't have ready access to health care. So we need to allow nurses who have received the training and can prescribe to be able to use their training and their education. We also need to look at telemedicine. Um, Arizona and the University of Arizona is a pioneer in utilizing telemedicine, particularly on native lands and working with the tribes to be able to provide high quality medical access through telemedicine. So I think it needs to be a mix of we need to provide greater infrastructure like having broadband access to facilitate that telemedicine, but also allowing women and men who have gone through years and years of training and chose to stay as nurses to be able to practice to the full extent of their ability. Thank you. Ms. Galvadon, 
Looking back at the May special election, the vote on Prop 123 in Arizona Education and Finance Amendment was very close. Were you supportive of the measure? If so, why? And if not, why not? Uh, uh, clarification, are you asking about Prop 123? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, actually, I did support Prop 123. This was something that, that um, um, our allies, uh, the Arizona Education Association was backing our Children Action Alliance. And, but, and the preference that, that we would, there would be a second step to that because the governor and, and my colleagues from across the aisle said, this is only our first step. Well, through this, uh, I mentioned the Arizona Schools Now. That is an init this, That is a, a group that has come together to to put to put some pressure onto our, our governor in regards to do that second step. And as uh, our Democratic Caucus is working on uh, working with all those organizations, so that we can do that second step. So again, this did bring money into our schools, but it's not enough. We need to have more investment in our schools. Thank you. Mr. Bauman, what is your position toward increasing individual states' rights and granting less power to the federal government? Um, interesting question. Uh, I think that the state government and individual local governments do have the best access to the values and will of the residents of those communities. On the other hand, we fought the Civil War in this country because oftentimes states and communities make decisions that we can't validate as a country. And so I think there are certain areas of interest that the, that the country needs to take responsibility for, among them civil rights, uh, protecting uh, rights of disabil disabled individuals, minorities, women, uh, and funding certain things like defense and perhaps to a greater extent, education. On the other hand, I think that states and communities do need to have a direct access to uh, the democratic will of, of, of the residents of those communities. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Hernandez, what is your position on voters having to provide identification in order to vote in Arizona elections? You know, voter ID laws have been created as an attempt to solve a problem that doesn't exist, which is voter fraud. So I think the first thing we need to talk about is the fact that voter fraud is not a problem nationally, locally, or at any level. So when we're trying to look at creating opportunities for people to access a ballot box, it's something that I've had experience from my first bill that I ever worked on and got passed in 2010 as a student at the University of Arizona to increase students' access to the voting booth on election day, HB 2368, which was sponsored by Matt Hines. We created opportunities for students to have access to early polling locations on campus that would be guaranteed by the universities to provide those spaces to the county supervisors and to the county recorders because we know that when you allow people to use their signature verification versus their ID verification. It is easier to vote when you're moving across from place to place every nine months or so when you're a student. Or if you look at some of our transient parts of Arizona where people may not change their IDs as frequently as they should. So allowing all folks to have greater access through early voting I think is an important way to solve the issue of voter access. Thank you. Ms. Galvedon, in general, what are your thoughts on ways the state should address the ongoing drought affecting Lake Mead and the Colorado River in order to ensure a stable water supply for future generations? You know, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to begin by saying that, that I, I was very happy when the state of Arizona put more money towards the Arizona Department of Water Resource. Those are the, uh, that, that agency is our watchdog. When it comes to the Colorado River, and right now I, the last article that I read was at, at 1,074 feet. So it's, it's a foot below what, what it, what it um, when we're calling the shortage on the river. Um, the drought is a, is a very important, so I'm, I'm very happy that the state of Arizona is, is talking to other basin states in regards to, to um, agreements. I know that California is, is, is talking to us, and that's very good because they're not going to get any, any cut in the Colorado um, River if there is a shortage. So again, we, uh, the state of Arizona needs to look, look at that um, and, and getting some good water policy so that we can address uh, water shortage and to really uh, get water sustainability on the front burner. Thank you. Mr. Bauman, what are your thoughts on the United States further restricting immigration? Terrible. I think that we're a country of immigrants. I, my, all, all of my 
great-grandparents or great-great-grandparents were immigrants. My great-grandfather moved to Nogales from the East Coast and prior to that from Russia and built a life here when there was nothing in Arizona. He was a tailor for Camp Little, for the soldiers stationed on the border, and pulled himself up from his bootstraps, so to speak, and built a business in the desert. And the current national immigration debate fails to, fails to consider the circumstances of individuals. And I think that's the flaw of all politics, especially, especially politics from 30,000 feet. And so when we're talking about immigration, we have to talk about what motivates individuals to seek a, better uh, seek a better life for themselves. And when we do that, we'll realize that comprehensive immigration reform, rather than militarization of the border, is the answer. Thank you. So we're, it's now time to give our closing remarks. Um, the first closing statement will be given by Mr. Hernandez. You'll have one minute. One minute. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you to uh, my fellow candidates. As I've mentioned in the past, I have a track record of getting things done. I'm a pragmatic progressive who wants to go to work for you at the state capitol. For the last five years, I've had the honor and distinction of serving in the Sunnyside Unified School District, but I've been appalled by the decisions that continually are being made by folks up in Phoenix. In LD2, we have a unique opportunity to take a seat back and make sure that we have another Democratic representative with the Latino voter registration advantage and the Democratic voter registration advantage. This is a district that never should have flipped. And I'm gonna be the candidate to make sure we get rid of Chris Ackerley and make sure we take this seat back to be able to have one more voice up at the Capitol to ensure that our progressive values are being represented and being represented well. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Galvadon, your closing comments. Thank you. It has been an honor to serve as your Arizona State Representative for the last four years. Uh, it, you know, before that, I was uh, um, on the south of the town council. And, and why I bring that up is because I serve on the county and municipal affairs. And I have to tell you, the state of Arizona really um, does uh, a number on our municipalities and counties. Um, I continue to serve my community not only as your legislator, but I also serve on boards. And it, I love... I love being a public servant. I love serving. It is an honor to continue to serve. I would like to continue to serve for two more years. And so when you vote, I, I ask for your support. This is, this is something that, that um, uh, I believe is, I, I, I'm doing a good job. I believe I'm doing a good job. I wanna continue to do a good, good job. And I, I thank everyone that I meet and I thank everyone that, that, I, that I talk to and, and they greet me is because I know I'm doing a good job because they tell me. And that's what, that's what I was elected to do was to serve my constituency. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Bowman, your closing comments. Thank you. I'll say that running for office has tested my resilience. It's very hard. And so I'll use these, these last few seconds to ask all of you as individuals, as citizens, to think about what goes into running for office and what goes into holding office, and to try to take that into, into treating your public servants the way, so to speak, that you, that you would like to be treated. Because in running for office, I'm trying to demonstrate honesty and integrity and a capacity to shape the law for the better. And when the citizens of the district, the constituents of the district, oftentimes are so disillusioned with politics that they have nothing, they want nothing to do with myself as a candidate or with the office holders, it makes it, it makes it increasingly difficult to get anything done. And so I think we all need to come together, candidates, office holders, citizens, voters, to do what we can to avert this course of disaster that we see in this state and in this country. Thank you. To our candidates, we thank you so much for participating in our forum. And to the audience members, we thank all of you who took the time to come and inform yourselves before voting. We encourage you to visit www.azcleanelections.gov where you can find information about the upcoming elections, download the Clean Elections app, and learn about the candidates running for office. A link to the video of this debate, as well as other clean elections debates, will be posted on that site within 72 hours of a scheduled debate. Please fill out the debate evaluation form you received as you entered and return it to one of our volunteers. Your feedback is important to the commission and it will help us improve future deba debates. 
Thank you all for coming tonight, and you are welcome to stay and speak directly with the candidates. Good night.